If you disobey me and remain hostile to me, I will act against you in wrathful hostility. I, for my part, will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your cold places and cut down your incense stands, and I will heap your carcasses upon your lifeless idols. I will spurn you. I will lay your cities in ruin and make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not savor your pleasing odors. I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle it shall be appalled, and you I will scatter among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword against you. Your land shall become desolation, and your cities a ruin. Mad God is by far the most intriguing horror movie I've ever seen. This movie actually has zero dialogue, which I didn't even know when I went into watching it, and I honestly didn't even think about it by how immersed I was in this movie. This story is told through the journey of someone known as the Assassin, who's kind of the main character. But at the same time, there isn't really a main character in this, because in the end, you realize that you're just kind of spectating a world. You're not necessarily seeing someone's life or someone's journey. You're kind of just seeing the horror. I will admit, I don't think I've ever seen anything that has reached this level when it comes to stop motion. The sheer amount of environments, the disgusting, unique looking monsters, I couldn't take my eyes off this movie and for a good reason. This movie is told through the eyes of the viewer by what they see and what they can piece together. Because we are viewing this world that is completely alien, but at the same time, it's somehow very similar to our world. Oh, almost as if it's just an exaggeration of what we could become. What a world with a mad god would look like. And when they say mad god, I don't really see it as an angry god or a vengeful god. I feel as though it's more like a god who has gone mad, has gone completely insane. Because some of the shit you see in here is not anger, it is pure insanity. But before we jump into this hellish movie and become extremely depressed, let's talk about something a little bit positive. That's today's sponsor. VR headset, mobile game, McDonald's? That's right, it's the Omega game. Now, if you guys like planes crashing, um, fighting, FPS multiplayer. That's right. Okay, fine. It's that's not that's not the sponsorship. Today's sponsor is actually a mobile game, and it is Raid Shadow Legends, of course. I fooled ya. you. You totally believed it was real, didn't you? Now, obviously, you guys by now probably know what Raid Shadow Legends is, but if you don't, it is a free-to-play immersive RPG with stunning graphics, engaging storylines, and over 650 champions to collect, and billions of ways to customize. You could build your dream team. You could battle other players, challenge powerful bosses. With over 80 million players worldwide, Raid Shadow Legends is the game that you've been waiting for. There's so much customization so many items, so many different characters, and different builds you can work around that are really fun to play with. And there is a lot more content than there used to be, like from a while ago when I sponsored them before. And this spring, Raid is going to have a huge dragon egg hunt event. All you have to do is download Raid Shadow Legends, go to this link right here, it'll be in the description, for a chance to win amazing in-game and out of game prizes. It's going to be ranging from a legendary raid champion to Amazon gift cards with a total value of $20,000. With all of this exciting stuff coming to raid, if you haven't started playing, now is the best time to get into it. New players can use my link or just scan this QR code right here and get a free starter pack. Also, if you guys want to join my clan, my clan's name is Piggies. Very original, very cool. And of course, thank you, Raid, for sponsoring the video. As the movie begins, we get a depiction of the Tower of Babel. This is based on the myth of the Babylonians wanting to build a tower to reach the heavens, and then God decided to end up confusing their languages to the point that they couldn't communicate anymore and couldn't finish the Tower of Babel. And it seems like this is not the only story. There are multiple different myths of people trying to build towers to reach the heavens, and gods always do something in order to stop them from reaching it. But it would seem in this world they succeeded, as all of the people are surrounding this huge 
huge tower cheering happily, while a figure, presumably the leader of these people, stands atop the tower. Now, it is kind of debated on who is at the top of the tower, if it's a, a god or if it's a person, because that person on top of the tower actually comes in later on. But this figure was then destroyed by lightning, and then a huge black cloud envelops the whole tower. This is the beginning of the mad god punishing everyone. This is the beginning of God's wrath. And it is followed by the showing of Leviticus 26. And I'm not really a religious person. I honestly thought this was just fictional writing by how absolutely horrific this is. You see a man inside a tube gradually being repelled down from the sky. As he cascades down through the ground, we see different layers of this world, almost as if each layer is a different world. In one area, we see loads of dinosaur bones. In another area, we see statues of creatures and beings, almost as if a graveyard of idols. Giant skulls of creatures unknown. And then he finally lands to what seems to be his final destination. The first encounter we actually see with him is extremely short. All that you see is little people yelling at each other, and then he just proceeds to step on top of them. And so instantly we can tell that our protagonist isn't really that good of a guy. He then sees a creature making monkey noises crawling out of this little pipe covered in bandages. It seems that he is fishing for food on land as he has this little string and a light on the end and he's pulling in another weird creature. Then comes out a monster with a butcher knife and ho oh ho boy! Oh boy, this gave me nightmares, man. But I'm just going to assume that a lot of these creatures used to be human. There's a lot on their bodies reminiscent of human anatomy. I mean, this disgusting creature has boobies. Ew! But it seems like the noise attracted him to this bandaged creature and all he does is he snatches him and chops him to pieces. Just because. And then the assassin just moves on without even attempting to help the poor creature. I think a big portion of the reason why this is so horrific is the fact that the assassin just shrugs. He's like, all right, he's dead. This world is so messed up that this is just commonplace. Just random creatures getting chopped up in front of people's eyes. It's just normal. But he then pulls out a map and the top of it kind of falls off. And from watching this, I could kind of assume every time he gets closer to where he's going, the pieces kind of fall off. He next finds himself in a room with something that actually looks very familiar because this looks like a monkey. I kind of have a theory about the whole monkey thing because there is a lot of monkeys in this or monkey-like creatures in this. Uh, obviously there's something important that happens at the end of the movie and I feel like it has to do with all these monkeys and religion itself and God. Kind of saying that all of what's happening right now was kind of before we came into the picture. Now that could be a thing or it could literally just be uh, they don't like monkeys. But this monkey is attached to an operating table, seemingly pleading for someone to help him. And then he locks eyes with the assassin, begging for him to help. We then pan over and see more creatures trapped in cages. And then we see a doll able to move on its own. And then it starts to come together when we zoom in on the eyes of the doll. And then we cut back to the monkey and notice that the eyeballs are the exact same. So we could obviously see there's some weird experiments going on where they're putting monkeys into dolls, I guess. And our protagonist, you know, being the great guy that he is, just closes the door and walks away. <laughs> Could have easily saved them, but he just leaves them to die. Throughout this journey, the assassin really does have many chances to help creatures, but he always decides against it, which, it could be looked at as he doesn't want to meddle in things that he's not supposed to be meddling in, but I don't really think that's it. Once you find out who the assassin is and, and who he works for and stuff like that, it kind of clears things up. He is not a hero. That's all I'm going to say for now. He's just another being a part of this hellish world. And again, we're just the spectator. Now, the next scene is pretty grotesque. We see a bunch of gigantic creatures being electrocuted to the point that their insides are melting out of them. And you can see the ridiculous scale of these creatures when you see the assassin standing next to them. And I'm going to be honest, the next part, I I can't explain. I There's not really anything that I can piece together of what the hell this abomination is. But basically, these creatures are melting. There's a face of another creature eating those melting creatures and then there's a bunch of pipes and then there's like balls 
that are breathing with eyeballs on them. I don't know what the hell they are. It's gross. It's scary. Oh, it's gross. But the next scene we see is pretty important. It's the assassin in this random factory. And these factories are creating these humanoid slaves. And these slaves are literally just fodder. And the product that this factory is creating is monoliths. And they're putting these monoliths into pyramids. But these humanoid creatures are constantly smashed rolled over, burned, stepped on, abused. Every possible thing you can think of happens to them. They're purely created to just do a task and die. And then when one dies, they just create another one. And they are shouted at over loudspeakers by someone with the voice of a child. The monitor is only showing an eyeball and a mouth shouting at them. And the baby voice and the eyeball is kind of a reoccurring thing, especially the eyeball. And I feel like the eyeball is supposed to be a reference to the eye of God watching over all of them, kind of relishing in their punishment, making sure that they're doing everything they're supposed to be. And when you watch it at first, you don't really think twice about these humanoid creatures. You don't really think they're conscious. You don't really think they're alive necessarily but one thing that solidifies the fact that they are alive and they do think as one of these humanoid creatures walks up to the assassin and then stops and kind of turns his head in curiosity and then the assassin kind of looks back at him and then you start to realize that holy shit these people are actually alive and again the assassin could have easily saved this humanoid creature but unfortunately he just watches him get smashed into the ground over and over by the creatures or the things that are running the place. I feel like this entire scene could be looked at as a dystopian idea of the working class. You know, capitalism, child labor factories, people who are working themselves to the bone and being paid little to nothing to survive. I mean, this is stuff that literally happens now in our society. And also it could literally just be a mirror to humans about slavery. Because yeah, this is a ridiculous looking thing, but I mean, this is kind of what slavery is. This world is completely void of compassion and apathetic to the suffering of others. I mean, never once does the assassin even flinch or, or, or think or care about reaching out a helping hand to save one of these poor creatures. Everyone in this world is just exploiting someone else or just being exploited, kind of like the world that we live in now. So the assassin finally reaches his destination and the suitcase that he was carrying was actually a bomb. He activates a bomb timer and we could see this huge tower of other bombs that never went off. This is not the first assassin to be down here in order to blow up this area and we can find out instantly why no one has made it back alive as this robot alien looking creature captures the assassin and for some reason the timer stops on the bomb and it doesn't go off it stops one second away from going off the next scene is really interesting we see an audience of people watching the assassin on an operating table they strip him of all of his clothing as the audience kind of laughs at his suffering now me personally i feel like this scene is kind of in reference to the world of entertainment because as a spectator as a viewer you don't really think about what happens behind the art. Movies, music, art, comedy, any forms of artistic expression, the viewer only sees the product. And when you spend that pain and suffering, the blood, the sweat, and the tears making something that means a lot to you, just to show an audience and then them laugh at that blood, sweat, and tears, it kind of just feels like torture, which is what the assassin's going through. And obviously another thing this could be is just another reference to how the upper class doesn't realize the suffering of the working class and are at the top kind of laughing down at the bottom while they're all just in severe pain. But I feel like Phil Tippett chose a theater on purpose. It really references to movies, which is something I'm sure he deals with all the time. You know, the audience will laugh, they'll cry, they'll, they'll feel all these emotions at the product, but they don't know what went into this. They don't know the blood, sweat, and tears. Now, this next scene, I honestly am not going to be showing much of it, or I'll at least blur a lot of it, as it definitely has the most gore in the entire movie. So our main character is completely wrapped like a mummy, and we zoom out to see all of the previous assassins that were sent down there. And now we can kind of see what happened to all of them. This next part heavily focuses on the passing of time and the clocks as a whole. We see a clock and hear that sound of the clock passing time. You know, it starts slowing down, and then it starts speeding up, depending on the situation. I feel 
feel as though this whole scene really focuses on mortality and how little time we truly have. Not to mention the fact that the assassin is about to get all of his innards completely ripped out, which I feel like is why the clock is speeding up time, kind of saying like his time is out. So two doctors come in covered in blood. They rip open his chest and kind of just start going, going in. They start ripping out organs throwing things everywhere. But after all of his organs are gone, something interesting happens. They start pulling out jewelry and gold and other gems. It, I was kind of confused at first, but if you think about it, this could easily just be the intrinsic value of the human life. After a while of digging, they find a disturbing looking worm baby that cries like a human baby. And we'll talk about that creepy baby worm thingy later. They end up taking the worm baby away and then they just drill a giant hole into his head, shove a pipe in there and I guess that makes them be able to see his memory because next what we see is the surface world uh what I assume to be the surface world at least and it is full of war pigs and this is where we really start to realize the assassin is just as expendable as those humanoid workers obviously referring to war and how soldiers are kind of treated as pawns and fodder we then meet someone who is known as the last man I'm not really sure why that's what he's known as but that is his name on IMDB and he and the two doctors and a few other things are the only things that aren't stop motion which I think it's pretty cool that some things are stop motion and some things aren't this guy has extremely long nails not sure why he, he has long nails I, I guess just to be gross I, I I don't know, because as you can see, he's living a pretty safe and comfortable life while sending all of these soldiers to their death and not even really caring. You know, kind of like our world. And then he has three little old ladies hanging out under the table. But I'm just assuming this has to be the fates or referencing the fates. They're creating this map made of what it looks like skin that we saw the assassin have earlier. Even get to see the last man send the assassin down the tube that we saw at the beginning. The assassin's first stop seems to be this destroyed sea. And then we see this red creature come down and just start zapping what is left of the human. And it's pretty interesting because he actually sees someone looking at him through a window in a building. So that means that there are definitely life still here in this broken down city what was left he ends up finding a car and hot wiring it and passes through an area with piles and piles of bodies skulls on top of spikes and then a hellish war zone so i'm assuming all the stuff that he drove through before is just kind of the dumping zone for all of the dead bodies of the soldiers which you know kind of happens in war. I mean, back then, wherever the soldiers died just happened to be their graveyard. But in this war zone, we see bombs go off, we see tanks driving around. It's so interesting how the assassin is just completely unfazed by everything happening around him, which it could just be showing how some soldiers just become numb to the war around them. He passes by a wall that says, Joel is a retard. Um... I have no idea what that has to do with anything, and I don't know why it's in the movie. I, I looked it up, couldn't find anything on this thing. I don't know why it's there. I, it's not a reference to any cast or crew. I looked up all their names. No one's named Joel, so I don't know. He makes it to the entrance of his goal, and we cut back to the now deceased assassin. One of the doctors takes this crying creature that we talked about before and walks up to this giant door and what appears is a floating creature that has a plague doctor outfit on. Now, I'm not sure if this is the same being we saw at the beginning that was on the top of the Tower of Babel uh, because he looks quite similar, or it might just be someone who is similar to him. But he ends up taking this creature and there's a very long sequence of him walking to the alchemist, showing how far away he is from everything else, which could imply that this character is God, but I don't think this character is God, but I think he's trying to play God. But he takes this creature and the alchemist smashes it and makes some sort of a shining pile of dust. He throws it into a forge and what proceeds is actually the Big Bang. I don't think it's the Big Bang, but it is a Big Bang. It's just a birth of a new universe. We see the sun, we see a bunch of planets, we see something that looks like Earth, and we see an alien spacecraft followed by a monolith that was created earlier flying into a blank planet. And whenever it lands, 
life is created. And we kind of speed straight to modern time, a world of cities, skyscrapers. And if we look at this shot, we can actually see that this is very similar to the Tower of Babel at the beginning of the movie. And just like the Tower of Babel, destruction follows. Two girls plant a bomb similar to the one the assassin had, and they end up getting taken out by who knows what. But after this bomb explodes, it doesn't just destroy the city, but it destroys everything. Bodies being buried, death all around, a black hole ends up forming, and the monoliths leave. As these monoliths gave life, they just kind of took it away. Now, I believe whoever this plague doctor is, like I said before, he's trying to play God. He's trying to create a universe that isn't as much of a hellscape as the universe that they're living in now. Another world where it isn't full of destruction and death, but he failed. And it seems like this is not his first time trying this, as there are so many different monoliths out there. Now, one thing is for sure, he is kind of like the leader of this factory. He is the one pulling the strings of everything. And I feel like this is implying that there isn't really a way to find peace. No matter what we do, there's no way we're going to make a universe without war, without death, without destruction. We cut back to see a baby in a jar. This and the monoliths are both references to 2001 A Space Odyssey. But in the end, we see a bunch of clocks and they're all ticking away, time passing as fast as we can see, candles burning out, hourglasses falling, incense burning, showing how everything has a time limit, flashing pictures of what we saw throughout this movie, reversing time back to now to see that the bomb that the assassin had placed finally reached his time. And then a cuckoo clock comes out and glares at the screen. We don't see an explosion, but we obviously can see that the bomb has went off and that this universe or this world is over. The time to try to save it is up and there's nothing that they can do about it. And this is obviously a huge reference to our world, like we're destroying our planet, time's running out. This plague doctor, regardless of his methods, he seemed to be the only one trying to fix things with that last ditch effort, but it was in vain. It seems like the entire world was just out of time. That was his last chance and it failed. And obviously it could just be a reference to life itself. You know, you could try to stall the bomb going off, but no matter what, sometime or another, the bomb's gonna go off. Now the movie ends with a very quick scene of that last man looking down at the hole of where the assassin went. And this is why I don't think the plague doctor is God. I feel like this man is God. I mean, think about it. Throughout this movie, he's the only person who can look down. Everyone else can only look up. He is on top of all of this hell down here, these hellish worlds. Is he just the one pulling all of the strings? Is he the one trying to destroy all of his terrible creations down there? I mean, he is in control of the fates. It's very short, but if you think about it, the Towers of Babel are always trying to reach the heavens, and he's the only one who can look down. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is Mad God, one of the most interesting, cool, freaky, terrifying, disgusting, awesome movies that I would highly recommend that you watch. The movie's only on Shudder. It's like the horror movie Netflix. I did a sponsor for them a while ago, so. But thank you all for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to share with your friends if you like this video. And also, a very kind thank you to all of my patrons because most of my videos tend to get copyright claimed and I appreciate every little dollar that you guys send my way. You guys are the best. Love you all. I'll see you in the next one.